United States, about 3 million people have epilepsy. Find out about the psychological challenges of living with epilepsy, how to cope with those challenges, and what friends and family can do to help, next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. In previous seasons, we've talked about the psychological aspects of what traditionally have been considered to be physical health problems, you know, that whole mind-body connection. And tonight, we're taking a closer look at what it's like to live with epilepsy. Of course, since we're a show about mental health, we're focusing on the psychological aspects of living with seizures, both for the person with epilepsy and their family and friends. Our phone lines are open for your questions, so call them in now. Locally, dial 218-788-2844 or call toll-free at 1-877-307-8762. We'll be answering your questions tonight throughout the show. Joining me is Dr. Doug Heck, a licensed psychologist with the Duluth Psychological Clinic who's been working with people with epilepsy and their families for many years. And Brett Garnett was diagnosed with complex partial seizures during her junior year of college. Now she's living with her husband, attending nursing school, and has been seizure-free for the past five years. Thanks to both of you for coming out on this very frigid January in the new year of 2015. And I think I'd like to start with you, Doug. And I know when, when people um, think of the word epilepsy and they think of, of even the illness of epilepsy, they might say, well, that should have been on the show before yours on Doctors on Call mm -hmm. and don't necessarily associate it with a show about mental health. But tell me a little bit, you know, obviously this is a passionate, you're passionate about mm -hmm. this topic and just about how that it is relevant to a show on mental uh, health and mental illness. Sure. I think um, one of the ways that it's relevant is that epilepsy or just seizures themselves are a, a symptom of something that's wrong with the brain, something that's not working quite right, something that maybe isn't quite um, uh, in the right place where it should have been. Something is wrong with the brain that's causing seizures. And so if there's something wrong with the brain, there's potential for it to affect how we think, how we feel, how we behave, how we interact, how we get along in our world. And so simply because of where the disease or the disorder is coming from, that's the connection with, with mental health. And we're gonna be talking about, I think, all of those different areas that you, mm -hmm. that you just mentioned. But I wanna get to you, Brett, and because you, you have quite a story to share. And first of all, just wanna thank you so much for even being willing to come on and share your story. Mm -hmm. But maybe start at the beginning um, and I might have you sort of tell the story in, in, in phases, but you were a junior in college, yep. had never had a seizure before. Correct, I was 20, um, and the first one that we know of after a night class, I had called my mom, and I didn't sound right on the phone. My aunt worked on campus, and she met me at the, we had the center clock tower at UW-La Crosse, and um, she got me to the emergency room, and I don't remember any of that. And after a lot of tests and staying up for the EEGs, um, we finally were diagnosed with seizures. Not um, grand mal or tonic-clonic where you fall to the ground and shake, but complex partial where you blink out. And everyone's different. Some might blink out for a couple seconds, others um, maybe longer, but so mine didn't, might not look like seizures to some. Hmm. But, and then I was supposed to study abroad that next semester in New Zealand um, and had to put that on hold. But it was just kind of scary, away by yourself, away from family. Um, and my now husband was in Superior, so it's kind of all by myself on my own. And so what was that like when you first got that diagnosis? Scary, it was really scary. I, <laughs> you could be anywhere on campus and something could happen at a minute's notice. I could fall down or end up somewhere. I might miss important information in a class and not do well in an exam because of it. Um, it was just really hard and depressing. It was a hard time. 
And um, is, what do you see in your work with people with epilepsy? And maybe we would take this sort of like as someone with a new diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, is what Brett is describing um, similar to what you see in your own practice? Mm -hmm. It is. I think people go through a very uh, understandable time of, of saying, is this really what it is? Is it really seizures? Is it really epilepsy or not? Is it really, maybe I'm just tired or maybe I'm just, um, maybe I, I'm not eating right and go through a number of other questions and they really question the diagnosis for a while. And then after a while, the, the diagnosis does seem to make sense. There's a lot of uh, questions about what can I do about it? How can I begin to live with this? As a student, if you're in school, you begin thinking about how is this going to affect my ability to learn, to get my degree, to do what I want to do with my life. Um, so there's a lot of questions that come up. That's why it's so important for people who are early diagnosed to have good information, good contacts with their physician, their medical team, and then to have somebody else around who has gone through that. Um, somebody else who's, who's had seizures or other family members who can come in and kind of help people know what's coming up and mm -hmm. kind of give them a pathway to follow. And did you have that, Brett? I had no one. I didn't know anyone who had seizures beforehand. Um, there was a friend of a friend of a friend who had um, that we started asking, but you can look online and get info, but being able to find someone else who actually has it to talk to is so empowering, and I finally found that up here um, with the Epilepsy Foundation with a support group. So in, in the beginning, though, you were kind of like that first person to walk on Mars is what it must yeah. have felt like. I'm a stranger in a strange land. Yeah, here. I just pulled away, and I because after seizures, you become very tired, and the meds just kind of make you like a walking zombie. I pulled away from everyone. I didn't do anything. I just go home and sleep and just confusing, like, is it, am I supposed to stay in school? <laughs> How am I going to accomplish this and accomplish my dreams? But it was very difficult, and I really look back now and wish I would have stepped out um, on campus. They have uh, free counseling, and I really wish I would have done that. Um, but you always look back in life and wish you could do something different. Mm -hmm. Although there might be somebody watching right now, so right take like that, that's, of it. that's part of the whole point of why we do yeah. this show. If mm -hmm. you're watching right now, you've just heard your first bit of advice. If you're a newly diagnosed person and um, you're having some struggles, number one, don't isolate yourself. Yes, is, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Most definitely, um, reach out for help and um, definitely the use of these amazing counselors, no matter where you are, um, and especially if you think there might not be money, there's a way that you're able to get in and have someone to talk to. That's very important. One of the struggles is that it's, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing to be in a situation at school or socially, and the next thing you know, you've missed conversation, or in worst cases, you wake up and you're on the floor, or in some cases, you've wet your pants because mm -hmm. you've lost control of your bladder. It's, it's extremely embarrassing, and so it's very natural for people to say, I don't want to go through that again. So I'm going to maybe pull out of school for a while, or I'm going to go home and just stay at home until maybe this will go away, or maybe I'll wait for my medicines to work. And so it's very natural to withdraw, but it's exactly not, it's exactly what we, we don't want people to do. Because that, that will really make the problem worse than mm -hmm. not, make it, not make it better. Yep. That, that sort of that fear of embarrassment and humiliation just in my mind also just brings up that epilepsy is one of these medical conditions that has a lot of stigma associated with it. Yes. And, and I thought, you know, really also why I thought that that was another good fit for this show mm. is that it just reminds me so much of the stigma associated with mental illness. And how, um, what, was that a factor for you at all in your not wanting to go out? Yeah, most definitely. And I was scared. I had my first friend in college didn't want to be around me. She was scared I'd do something to her or epilepsy was going to get her. Um, but I never said epilepsy. I was scared of the word. I said seizure disorder and said it sounded a little bit better, not uh -huh. as harsh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it was scary because I might not hear a message or um, be with friends that we were walking downtown and I might get lost or not sure what would happen. So definitely exactly mm -hmm. what you said. Mm. And how do you see that, that whole stigma of the, of the illness of epilepsy affecting others? Oh, it's, it's, um, 
It's tremendous, actually. I, I have hope that it's getting better um, because those of us who are working with people with epilepsy and working through the foundation and other organizations are constantly trying to educate, and this is why this show is here. We're trying to help people see um, that a lot of people believe things about epilepsy that aren't necessarily true, that it's contagious or that it's um, genetic, and so if there's someone in their family, they're bound to get it. So I think it's really important that people really have a good understanding about it. Children with seizures are especially prone to stigma because if you have a seizure in front of your classmates, uh, it's very, very difficult for them to necessarily understand what just happened. And the next thing you know, you're in the, ch in the school nurse's office and you're gone for a little while, and then maybe you come back that day or the next day, and students can sometimes can be kind of harsh and saying things, which then makes it even more difficult for that student to want to go back to school the next day. And then the parents are really wrestling with how do we get our eight-year-old to go back to school now after he's had a seizure in school and has been really embarrassed. So that's, the stigma can affect the, at that level and with adults as well. So, so let me ask you, what would you say to a parent who, um, who has a child right now um, who there, who either um, has gone through that and they're feeling protective of that child, maybe even are, have some trepidation about sending them back to school. What would you say, it, what's a good way for the parent and the school to work together with that? Yeah, there's a very, actually this is a well, um, kind of a well thought through process. And the process that we've seen to be especially helpful is that through the Epilepsy Foundation, there is a very formal kind of program that can result in somebody coming into the classroom and providing some education, maybe first off for the teachers. And then there's even um, a program that allows for the children or the students to learn about seizures in a, in a way that's non-stigmatizing, in a way to help them understand that this is something that uh, does happen occasionally and help them understand more about that student. And then there are um, a lot of, there's a lot of help available for uh, teachers to know what to do in case the seizure happens. Do they have the student leave the classroom or do they have them just stay in place? Um, there's a lot of information for parents about talk, how to talk with their teachers, how to talk with the school nurse. Um, the Epilepsy Foundation has done a lot of work with school nurses in particular to try to coordinate care between teachers, school nurses, doctors, and parents, and kind of form a team. And the student as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, and that's also with the Epilepsy Foundation just here in Duluth, people could contact. Absolutely. Which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Um, I bet you wish you would have had that. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> and one thing off of what Doug said, um, the Disability Resource Center, I know for college students, but also K through 12, your guidance counselors, all of those people are fabulous resources. And not being scared of telling the teachers or your close classmates what is happening in case something does happen um, and explain what to do, whether or not to call 911 if need be. Mm -hmm. um, but let them know what's happening. So you're not blanking out and not paying attention in their lecture, but something is actually happening. So, mm -hmm. And was that something that you were able to do then, was to contact the Disability Resource yes, Center? Yes, they were very helpful. Um, at the beginning of the semester, they always encourage you, if you have a disability, go forward and talk um, to the Disability Resource Center, and then they can work with you and your professors if um, they need an actual medical note saying this is for real, or um, if they're Sometimes I need to take my test by myself after I had had a lot of seizures or something, but take advantage of those resources. They're there for us, even though sometimes we forget they're there. And I always talk with people in my own practice who have any kind of disability, uh, especially if they're, they're college students, uh, don't wait until there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if you already know that you have a condition that a disability resource center will be helpful with, mm -hmm. um, be proactive about that so that you have things in place so that if you need to access them that you've already done that work mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of what you were you were talking about Most as well. Definitely. You're already paying for it, so why not use it? Oh, I <laughs> like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, get your money's worth, that's right? right. <laughs> get, get your money's worth with your education. The, the unpredictability of seizures, um, that has to, you know, even if, if you have two a year, it doesn't, they don't schedule themselves. No, <laughs> they don't. 
That's one of the unique uh, difficulties with epilepsy, I think, is and seizures, is that um, you can be, as we are talking right now in the next moment, not really aware of what's going on. So that unpredictability is especially difficult for all of us who wake up in the morning and expect that our body is going to allow us to do what we plan on doing that day. Um, so one of the things that we do to try to help people with that is to work with their physicians and their medical team to make sure that they're on the right medication, the right amount of medication to help them reduce their seizure frequency. And then um, what a lot of times we try to do is to help people be their own best judge of how likely they are to have a seizure on any given day. And there's two or three risk factors that are most likely to cause someone to be more at risk for having a seizure. And that's sleep deprivation, uh, if somebody has missed their medication, and if somebody is under a, a tremendous amount of stress. So let's see, which of those happen in college students? Just a couple. Of Just yeah. a couple of those. <laughs> so this is why college students as well as other people are often at risk for seizures mm -hmm. because they're not sleeping regularly and sometimes they'll miss their medicine. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is looking to make their seizures more predictable, we encourage them to get up in the morning and just take a quick look at, have I missed my medicine? Have I been getting good sleep? Am I uh, under a lot of stress? And if they are, then they kind of lay a little bit lower that day. Maybe not go on that road trip or something else that they're planning and maybe wait until they're feeling a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So. With, with a condition that's uncontrollable in some cases or unpredictable, there are some ways of bringing about a little bit more predictability to it. How did you manage, you know, you, you're, you're obviously coping well. And so um, what was that process like for you getting used to that notion of the unpredictability? Oh, it was hard trying to figure out, try to do your best with sleeping and figure out how to eat properly and keep stress down. but. Um, you just kind of took one day at a time. You tried to keep a journal, remembering what things were going. If something was just off that day, like I wouldn't walk to the pharmacy or the chiropractor. You just, sometimes you just have to nix things and say you got to keep your safety in line. Um, or contact others and let them know, hey, this isn't a good day. Um, you just need to kind of have a, something there just in case. And also like a medic alert bracelet in case also. Sure. Being smart, yeah, right? being smart, mm -hmm. being smart, and 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 that you know even the willingness to wear a medic alert bracelet, mm -hmm. bracelet about being acceptance that yes, this is a part of my life yes. now, because that that might I, I was kind of thinking as you said that like oh even even that takes some courage to put that bracelet on for the first yes. time. Yes, mine actually just broke. Otherwise, I do wear one, <laughs> but. Um, for even interviews or going um, out with new people and friends, I used to cover it up with a bracelet or something. Oh, really? Um, just, yeah, the stigma, like, oh, what is that for? Mm -hmm. And I work in healthcare, and some people would actually ask, like, why do you have that? What's, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's definitely a stigma about it. Mm -hmm. the, um, one of the other um, aspects of epilepsy is some of the losses that people experience, the loss of independence, especially if this means like you're a driver and now all of a sudden you're not a driver. And in, in, in the, some of the reading that I was doing, um, there was a comment about if you've had uh, one seizure, um, your uh, driver's license can be taken away immediately, but if you have one DWI, you can keep your driver's license. Mm -hmm. um, and and that was that was put in such a way that that, that kind of felt like oh that that was shocking mm -hmm. um, shocking in a way that that it's like I, I should wake up to, to, to that but tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about just that whole the the losses and restrictions I think that people experience then with their independence yeah I think I'd like to say that not everyone with with epilepsy experiences a lot of losses or not everyone struggles with depression or the isolation mm -hmm. Um, you know, Two-thirds of people with epilepsy get placed on medication and their seizures get under pretty good or reasonably good control. And about a third of people really struggle with seizures even though they're under some medical care. And those are the people that are going to be more at risk for experiencing a lot of losses. And the losses are, are for those individuals can involve the loss of 
maybe a career, maybe somebody didn't, wasn't able to get their seizures under as good of control as you did and so they weren't able to finish school. Mm -hmm. Or the loss of friends is tremendously difficult for younger children, adolescents, teenagers, because that's what they're all about at that age and so um, once they have a seizure around others, their friends disappear and pretty soon they're by themselves and isolated at home again. Um, losses can involve losses of jobs because they were doing well until their seizures began and then had some difficulties on the job and their employer let them go. So there's a number of losses definitely that can happen. And the issue with the losses is how do people manage, how do they cope? And this is when depression can happen. Mm -hmm. And depression is just such a common difficulty for people with seizures. And that's what we really want to help people understand is that it's not uncommon to get depressed. It's kind of a natural consequences of a lot of the losses. But again, it's an important piece to make sure that people are bringing forth and trying to get help with. And what were the losses that you experienced, if any, then? I think three top ones. One was going to New Zealand. That was a dream since I was a little kid, and hopefully that'll still happen. Um, but also... That was the study abroad that yep, you were going to do. Yeah, the study abroad. Um, but also just the friends. Like, you hear college, and that's the best time of your life to meet friends, and that was a real hard time for me. I'm pulling back in a way and not having those friends. But also, my now husband, he went TW Superior, and I went TW Lacrosse, so... Um, no transportation. In Minnesota now, they take it away for three months. Um, it used to be six months for your license. Um, you have to find different ways to get around. You're so used to be able to go grab your keys and go, and that's your independence. And when that's taken away, you have to look at walking. You can't bike. You might have a seizure. Um, you look at the bus. You look at the train. And um, you look at different ways in carpooling. It's really hard. You, you forget those wonderful luxuries you have until they're gone. Mm -hmm. Here is, here's a question, how can family and friends be supportive after a seizure? And I'm gonna give that question to you because <laughs> to I think you've got the answer to that. <laughs> well, definitely just being there, supportive, um, get you in a safe environment if need be. Um, but encourage those things we talked about if need be, go and see counselors or, um, but also be there for the emotional support and the hugs and the love when you need it. What, what do you want, what would you want somebody to say so if you, you, you know, that whole idea of telling somebody that you have epilepsy the first time, and I think, you know, what a lot of people who have never met somebody or they don't know that, they don't know that they've met somebody with epilepsy because no one has shared that with them before, feel stuck about like, I don't know what, I want to be supportive, but I want to say the right thing. Um, what are the right things to say? To say after someone has said, I have epilepsy, um, say, how do I respond to your seizure? Um, what can I do? Do I need to call 911? Um, and what would you like me to know uh, to be able to help you and get you in a safe environment? And um, like for me, light sensitivity, some things that they need to know I can't be around, like in a concert or stuff. Um, blinking lights and such. So just ask more about it, see what they need to be in a safe environment and how you can support them, both physically and mentally. And so that you would you you don't want people to be afraid to ask you yes, questions. Yes, I'm then. very open with that. But yeah, ask questions, find out more about it and see what that individual needs. And like you've said, each individual is different. Some might want to talk about it more than others. And, and I think a big part is to not lose sight of the person Yes. The person with the condition of epilepsy. It's it, the person who has this condition needs to be out there first and foremost. Hi, my name is Brett. I like pizza and I want to go to New Zealand and and to make sure that when you're when you're talking to people about it that, that people are really understanding first and foremost who you are and let the epilepsy be in the background. I think that that is the perfect uh, note to end on. Uh, thank you so much to both of you uh, for being here and bringing the show to our community. I think this has just been a wonderful opportunity and, and I know I've learned a lot from it and I'm sure that you've learned, you've had to have learned some things uh, today as well. First and foremost, what you should have learned is 
isolation never helps. And this is a theme that we have on this show is connection, 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 connecting to building your own community. And if you find that some of your supports aren't there for you, then find new supports. I think that might be what Brett ha would have to say about that. And I think the other thing is what uh, Doug just said, which is that uh, if we were to introduce Brett, what we would say is this is Brett, she's going to need a job in nursing, you're going to want to hire her. <laughs> That's what I would say about Brett. Um, how wonderful for her to come and share her story with all of us. Now, if you want more information about epilepsy and living with seizures, the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota is an excellent resource. You already heard Doug giving some of the information that they have. They list a 24 seven support and helplines and the helplines and web address are listed on your screen. And I will also put them on my blog, which you can read by going to our website at speakyourmindonline.org. That's also where you find our schedule of our topics and our resource links. And I'll answer more of your questions on the blog. Join us next Thursday when we'll be talking about work stress and what to do about it. Because from what I can see, most of us could benefit from some advice in this area. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.